This episode of Fireside Chat is brought to you by Robert Woodward, lawyer at Altador Law. He specializes in family law, wills, and estates for flame fans in Calgary and Southern Alberta. Call Robert at 403-771-2187 and mention Fireside Chat to get $100 off any legal service. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy holidays. The team here at Fireside Chat has taken some time off to spend with our friends and family. We don't have a new episode for you this week, but we don't want you to go without any Flames talk. So we're re-releasing an episode from 2015, where I talked to Theron Fleury. Enjoy this interview with one of the best Flames of all time, and we'll talk to you again in 2019. This is Dan Stevenson here for Fireside Chat, and we're pleased to be joined tonight by a Flames alumni who really needs no introduction. Uh, He's a Stanley Cup winner, multiple-time NHL All-Star, and an Olympic gold medalist. He's one of the best-known Calgary Flames. Theo Fleury, welcome to Fireside Chat. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, no problem. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, and we, we always ask our fans every year, if we can talk to some Flames and get their story, who would you want us to talk to? And every year it's overwhelmingly come back as Theo Fleury. You're still one of the most loved players on this that's ever worn a Flames jersey, so our fans are eager to hear from you. Oh, uh, that's awesome. So, Theo, you joined uh, the Flames really in the 89 season, that year that they had their uh, Stanley Cup win. And still to this day, if we talk to any Flames player who played on that team, they say how that team was unique and special. Uh, Sometimes the word magical has even been thrown around. What do you think made that team so unique and special? Well, I think there was lots of factors, you know. Uh, Words that I would use would be talent, talent. uh, would be, you know, the, I guess the first thing to come to mind, but I, I really believe it's the quality of people, you know, that we had on the team that, uh, you know, made us special. Not only were, you know, we're great hockey players, but I think we we're all, to a man, uh, you know, incredible people who, you know, cared about each other and, and uh, you know, we really enjoyed being together and, and uh, um you know, I think the two of them together, you know, was sort of a, you know, a lethal combination. Did you find that same kind of camaraderie with your teammates on a lot of the other Calgary Flames teams you played for, or even some of the NHL teams, or was that really a special chemistry with that 89 team specifically? Well, I would say, you know, most of the championship teams that I was involved with, um, you know, there was that commonality. There was, you know, a combination of you know, talent, ability, hard work, and then, you know, the quality of people. And, uh, you know, I think that that is always uh, a factor you need in any time that you uh, are on a championship team is that, you know, you need not only the talent and the ability, but you need, you know, the the quality of people, um, you know, from top to bottom in order, you know, to accomplish that. Do you think that we're starting to see that same kind of quality of people being built up in the current Flames team, both from the management perspective, the coaching, and the guys on the ice again? Yeah, I think they're definitely um, moving in the right direction. And, uh, um, you know, what people don't realize is the NHL is a difficult place uh, to win. And uh, winning is hard in the NHL. And, and, uh, so you need to create, uh, you know, a lot of different intangibles in order to create a winning situation. And, uh, um, you know, obviously the addition of, you know, Burke and um, Brad Tree Living and, and uh, you know, Bob Hart, you know. So, you know, I think they're, they're moving in the right direction. You know, obviously... Um, you know, the expectations that the team set you know, sure have been sort of, you know, a stumbling block for the team this year. And, uh, you know, um, but even with that being said, you know, I think they're still, you know, obviously moving in the right direction. Speaking of the team this year, being a guy who's been around your share of championship teams, as you said, teams that didn't do as well, 
What do you think maybe is not going so well for the Flames this year? What do you think maybe is causing the problems, and what do you think they need to do to turn it around? Well, I think the biggest uh, the biggest thing to learn as a young player. Uh, so I'm talking about Gujo, Monahan, Bennett, uh, you know, Hamilton. All those guys who played less than what four or five years in the NHL. Yeah, is the hardest thing to learn is to learn how to play with the puck. You know, when you come from junior hockey and, you know, basically, you know, the whole entire game, you know, when you're on the ice as a young super in whatever league you come from, you always have the puck. So when you get to the NHL level, everybody can play and everybody's good. And so, uh, you know, the biggest transition, especially for me early on in my career was learning how to play without the puck, which means I got to uh, learn how to play so that I can get it back on my stick. And once I have it back on my stick, then, you know, I can do the things that, that I do best and that's to make plays and score goals. And, and so, you know, and, and there's such a strength difference when you make the step from junior to the, to the NHL is, you know, you have to sort of grow into your body. It takes a few years to gain that strength through training in the off season and, and just maturing in general. And so, you know, that's what we're seeing from the team this year is that, you know, their inability to keep the puck out of their own net. And, you know, that's just a learning process you have to go through. And, you know, we're obviously not seeing the same goaltending uh, that we saw last year. Yeah, for sure. I think that's very well said. And, and I mean, that's what we get for being in the middle of a rebuild, right? We can kind of expect that time for these guys to learn those skills right now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we saw Colorado, you know, have that one big year when all their young guys were first in the league, and then they, it's been a transition, you know. Um, and... Uh, you know, the Oilers haven't been able to grasp onto that concept either. You know, I still see when I'm watching the Oilers play, I'm still seeing, you know, Taylor Hall make the same mistakes that he's made for five years. I'm seeing Jordan Eberle making the same mistakes made for five years. And- so, Theo, the the NHL game has changed a lot since you were playing, especially since you were wearing a Flames jersey. Um, as far as looking at the game now and the changes that have been made for better, for worse, what are some of the changes that you like and what are some of the things that you'd like to see still changing or evolving in the current game? I think the game's in a great state, you know, um, you know, obviously the game is faster. Um, you know, guys look after themselves better. Um, you know, they eat better, they rest better. Um, you know, uh, do you think they're treating them more like they're, I guess, athletes now than perhaps in the past? Well, I wouldn't say that. I just think that uh, you know we're we're evolving as a uh, you know as a human race, and you know we know more, way more about training and nutrition and all these things you know, <clears throat> than we did when you know obviously we were playing, and so you know that's what we're seeing is the evolution of the athlete in in general and uh you know i love three on three overtime now uh, you know there's a lot of yeah there's a lot of great things about you know where the game is at right now um you know obviously we know more about injuries you know we're getting guys back quicker you know than we did in the past and so you know um yeah, there's a lot of great things that, that uh, you know, uh, how the game's evolving. And uh, Do you, you still know, watch a lot of good. NHL? Oh, yeah. I watch as much as I can, you know. Um, you know, I'm not a fanatical fan, but I'm obviously, you know, I'm always interested in what the Flames are doing. And, yeah, so um, what would I change? I, I don't know if I would change. I, I don't like that they're talking about making the Nets bigger. Yeah, I mean, that kind of changes the era, too, right? Then you'd have an era of the smaller nets and the bigger nets. It'd be a weird change. Yeah, and, 
you know, that's the evolution of the goalie as well. You know, I would say when I was playing that the goalies weren't necessarily, you know, the best athletes or they were the most athletic, uh, you know, now they seem to be the, the best athletes and that's just, you know, how the game has evolved. And, and, uh, you know, I think making the equipment smaller is, is probably the answer to creating uh, more offense. But, you know, even by doing that, I think the goal, the goalies will adjust uh, to making the equipment smaller. So, you know, it's just where we're at. You know, the game is where we're at. But, you know, I still see teams on different occasions that, uh, that uh, you know, score seven or eight goals in a night. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure what they're talking about when they say they need more offense. But, you know, I think coaching is has been a big part of that. How, how so? Well, I, I think the coaches are playing Xbox with these guys, you know, basically. And, uh, you know, you don't see a whole lot of one-on-one play. You see a lot of dumping and chasing and uh, a lot of play being, uh, you know, played along the boards and the pucks kept out of the middle. Um, you know, when teams back check, they back check right to the, uh, to the hash marks, which creates a lot of traffic in front of the net, which creates a lot of opportunities and shots being blocked. And, you know, so, um, I, I think if they made the width of the rink 30 feet wider, so 15 on each side and widen the rink by 15 feet, that that would solve a lot of the game's problems and issues. Interesting. So almost an Olympic size of rink. But not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, interesting. The, you know, the, the what is it, 200 by 100. Yeah. So you're basically making it 200 by 95. Okay, so close. Yeah. Yeah, close. Interesting. Close. Or, or even seven feet on either side. You know, just make it, you know, a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So in anticipation for you coming on the show tonight, we'd ask some of our fans if they had any questions for you. And uh, one big question that we heard from a number of our fans on Twitter, um, number 14 has become part of your brand. Where did the number 14 come from? Why did you select that to be your number? <laughs> I didn't select it. They selected it for me. So. Oh, really? Yeah. When I, you know, I, I, my whole minor hockey league career and my whole junior career, I wore the number nine. And so when I got to Calgary, Lanny wasn't willing to give me that number. So, uh, they gave me number 14 and that's the number that I basically wore for my whole entire career. That's weird. Yeah. Cool. And then when I played, when I played for team Canada, uh, Brendan Shanahan, who was a lot of those times was on those teams, you know, he had more seniority than I did. And so, you know, that's why I chose to wear 74, uh, you know, for team Canada a few times. Did you ever think about flipping around to me in 41 for team Canada? No, that's a, it's not a cool number. 41. 74 no. was a cool number. I had a 74 flurry Jersey as a kid. Ah, there you go. Awesome. Um, uh, another question we got from one of our Twitter, uh, followers is, can you share with us one of your favorite stories or memories as a flame? Is there one kind of scenario that really sticks out for you? Maybe something that happened off the ice, maybe, you know, a, a an on ice scenario. What's the one thing that really sticks out to you as your time as a flame? You know, I was drafted in 1987 in the eighth round. And so, you know, I basically look at that as, there was actually 20 rounds of the draft that went by before I got drafted. So, you know, the year I was actually eligible, the first year, I didn't get drafted. And then, you know, another eight rounds after that. So, um, you know, I think that my whole entire life, you know, people told me that I was never going to, you know, play one game in the National Hockey League. And, you know, the Flames in 1987 gave me 
you know, that hope and that dream that, you know, I could actually maybe one day play in the NHL. And so I would say my whole entire career as a Calgary Flame, um, you know, them giving me a chance and them giving me an opportunity and, and then, you know, to be brought up on New Year's Day of 1989 and six months later, you know, carrying the Stanley Cup around the Montreal Forum and then going on to, you know, hold all these records with the Flames and, and all that. So I would say, you know, there's lots of incredible highlights that I had as a Calgary Flame, but, you know, I think most importantly was that, uh, that I got to live out my dream and, and, uh, and I did most of it, uh, you know, we're in the flaming sea on my chest, you know, from, from the Stanley Cup in 89 to scoring the, the goal in Edmonton, that iconic goal where I'm sliding across the ice to, you know, breaking Al McInnes's record and, and, uh, you know, and then coming back in 09 and making the comeback and, you know, having the opportunity to score that shootout goal, you know, there were so many incredible moments, uh, you know, as a Calgary Flame, I can't really say one was better or greater than the other. I, I just think my whole time uh, and my whole experience and, you know, learning from guys like Lanny and Pep and Timmy Hunter and, you know, all those incredible hockey players that I got to play with, Joe Newendike, Gary Roberts, you know, Sergey Makarov, you know, it was, it was really it was really a cool place. And that's, you know, why I, when I retired from the game and I'd moved away from Calgary, it was probably the biggest reason why I moved back to Calgary was that, uh, you know, Calgary is a special place for me and my family and, and, uh, you know, it is home and, uh, and, uh, you know, now to be retired and doing lots of amazing things, uh, not only in Calgary, but, you know, right across North America, it's been, uh, it's been pretty cool. You mentioned your uh, return in 09 and the shootout goal, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but the the player you scored on, the goaltender, who was with the Islanders at the time, was Kevin Poulin, who, interestingly enough, just got acquired by the Flames about two weeks ago and is now playing for our AHL affiliate. Yeah, I, I saw that, and uh, I don't know if you saw the tweet uh, that I tweeted out, but um, it was funny that... Uh, <laughs> You know, sometimes your your career comes full circle, you know, and and uh, you know that was a that was a special night at the Saddle Dome, uh, not only for myself but you know for everybody that was there and witnessed that. Uh, I had the privilege of being there, and it was it was an amazing night. It was an amazing night, and uh, um, you know, obviously I didn't get to leave the game on my terms, and uh, you know, when that puck went across the goal line in the shootout. Uh, uh, you know, it was my life sort of coming full circle and, uh, was so incredibly special, uh, not only for myself, but, uh, you know, after the game coming home and, and seeing all the social media stuff and people, you know, had recorded on their cell phones and, you know, grown men crying in the stands, uh, you know, it was a special evening and it was really kind of cool to be part of that. I remember just sitting in the stands that game and just looking around and seeing guys, just random strangers hugging each other after that goal. Like every, <laughs> no, it, everybody was just it, so happy for Theo Fleury. Yeah. Well, I was, it was really cool. Very, very cool. I, I don't know if it, if they did or not, but if the Flames would have offered you a two-way contract with the expectation of going to the AHL that year, would you have signed it? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That was something we talked about on our show at the time is that Theo would have been a great mentor in the AHL. Yeah. But you know, at 41 years old, you know, um, obviously I think it would have been, it's probably more important that they develop, you know, a player down there and not having me take ice time away from somebody and, and whatnot. So I'm sure that they, it was well thought out and, and, uh, you know, shortly after the comeback, my book came out and, and, uh, you know, I haven't really stopped since, since then. And, uh, you know, I've really found some incredible purpose, uh, for my life. And that's, uh, you know, helping other people who had similar experiences such as myself. And, uh, it's been incredibly rewarding and, uh, you know, it's really, you know, the purpose 
for me going through all that stuff, uh, you know, in my childhood and in my adolescence that, uh, you know, uh, that I absolutely cherish the most and it's, it's what I love to do. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've said that your mission statement right now is to help as many people get to where they want to go. And I think, you know, with the work that you've done, uh, you're definitely on that road. Yeah. There's no question about it. You know, um, I think, Nobody on the face of the earth is immune from trauma and, uh, and, uh, you know, my experience has been that, uh, a lot of people, uh, not only in Canada, but worldwide, you know, share a lot of my childhood experience and, you know, have those things that happen to them, uh, in life. And, and, uh, so yeah, it's been kind of very, very cathartic to, you know, do the work that I do now and, you know, inspire other people. And, and, uh, so it's been, it's been very cool. And, and like I said, you know, you, you never, you never know where your life's going to turn out or where it's going to end up and where you're going to be. But, uh, you know, I'm very happy that, uh, that I was sort of pushed into this, you know, this new role, uh, after hockey. And speaking of where life takes you, you've had quite an interesting career since you left hockey. You ran a concrete business, filmed a pilot for a reality show. You tried to market your own clothing line. You played pro baseball. You were on Battle of the Blades. You published two books. And now you have a country album out. Yeah. Do you ever sleep, Theo? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. I do. And uh, you're a busy man. Like I said, it's been it's been really cool. And and I think really the message is, is that you know no matter where. We're, where we are in life how old we are you know just go for it you know surround yourself with good people who are like-minded and uh work hard and are dedicated uh you know there's really nothing that you can accomplish in this in this world and uh you know we're incredibly excited about the album and and uh you know we're really proud of what we've sort of come up with and uh you know, we're looking forward to getting out on tour uh, in March. Uh, on March the 3rd, we'll be at the Grey Eagle Casino in Calgary putting on a show. So, you know, everybody who's out, who's out there listening, make sure you get down to the Grey Eagle on March the 3rd and, uh, you know, we'll put on a show for you. Tickets are available online. They start at 45 bucks. And if you're interested, there's a really cool VIP package that you can get. Uh, some levels include a meet and greet with Theo. It should be a fun night. Yeah, it'll be it'll be really cool. And we're starting the tour off in, in Saskatoon and Regina and Medicine Hat. Those are three places that uh, have a lot of history uh, uh, when I played for the Moose Jaw Warriors. So we're looking forward to, you know, to those uh, um, stops as well. So Theo, being Métis, I mean, music is part of the culture um, in many Native cultures, especially with the Métis. Growing up, did you play an instrument? Did you sing? How, where did this, you know, musical side come from? Well, my fondest memories as a child growing up in uh, Manitoba were sitting beside my grandfather, listening to him play the fiddle, and my dad was an entertainer, and my uncle was an entertainer, and, uh, you know, I actually have a cousin that lives in Calgary who uh, who has a who has their own band that plays a lot of the clubs here in Calgary, but uh, she finished uh, in the top 10 of Canadian Idol, I believe in 2005. So, um, you know, it is definitely a part of our DNA. And, uh, you know, I remember those family gatherings uh, when I was a kid that were, you know, somebody always had a guitar and a fiddle and, you know, there was a lot of singing and, and, uh, dancing and you know a lot of laughs and so yeah it uh and i always sang uh you know i always had a karaoke machine in whatever house i lived in whether that was in calgary or new york or chicago you know there was always a uh an opportunity for me to sing and you know when i retired uh, i had a friend in the music industry uh based out of winnipeg and you know, our dads used to play music together before we were even born. So, you know, it was kind of a serendipitous type of thing. And so I went to Winnipeg and uh, started writing uh, 
you know, songs, and uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh, experience. I bet. And I had the pleasure of listening to the album. Uh, there's ten songs in the album. When I listened to the album, I thought it was quite refreshing. I mean, there's so much, so much country. Today. It sort of has a poppy feel to it. Sort of this mainstream country. Yours is very much a, a throwback type album. It's very much your kind of classic country. Who were some of your musical inspirations when you were writing and putting this album together? Well, you know, when I was you know, sitting beside my grandfather, listening to my dad sing, you know, there was a lot of Buck Owens and Johnny Cash and, you know, uh, Conway Twitty, all these old guys that sort of, uh, you know, and I would say even uh, George Strait, Alan Jackson, you know, these kind of guys that, uh, you know, that were a major sort of influence. And, and uh, you know, when we, when we sat down to sort of figure out what kind of music we wanted to, put out there um we didn't want to be country pop or country rock or you know we wanted we wanted to bring back the you know the steel guitar and the fiddle and the banjos and the honky tonk piano and and uh so there's a lot of that influence uh you know in the album yeah you can definitely hear it it's it's quite it's quite cool yeah thank you when you were on the road, when you were, you know, playing hockey professionally, was country music sort of your, your favorite genre? Is that what you listened to on the road and in the dressing room and that yeah. sort of thing? Well, I didn't get to listen it to it in the dressing room because every time I put it on, the guys would turn it off. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I always had a, uh, well, I had a Walkman first, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's dating yourself, Theo. With cassette tapes. And then I had, uh, and then I had a disc man with uh, with all that, and and then eventually, you know, uh, had the old uh, sort of MP3 uh, player, and you know, they always had a lot of Johnny Cash, a lot of Buck Owens, and uh, uh, and I still have those guys on my iPhone and uh, on my iTunes, and so that's pretty cool. Know, I love I love the old old uh, country stuff, and uh, so yeah, the you know the album is sort of. Uh, you know, a thank you to my grandfather and my dad, uh, you know, for sort of giving me this musical talent that uh, I didn't really know that I had. Do you, do you plan to have a second album? Yes, absolutely. For sure. I, I have so many notes uh, on my iPhone of, you know, future songs and future ideas. So whenever there's something that pops in my head, I always make sure that I put it in my notepad on my phone. So I, I can't wait to hear the second one. Uh, the band, Theo Fleury and the Death Valley Rebels. Yes. Where did the name Death Valley Rebels come from? Well, uh, back in the 80s when the Oilers and the Flames had those amazing hockey teams, they called that stretch of highway between here and Edmonton, they called it Death Valley because when teams came in in the 80s, they usually left with zero points and, and a lot of minuses uh, uh, on their scorecard. And so they used to call that Stretch Highway Death Valley, and we thought, you know, that's a pretty cool name to, you know, to call the band. That's a that's cool. Um, I know there's a lot of people that you know have never heard the album yet. It only got released in October, but definitely go go grab a copy. It's only on iTunes right now, correct? Uh, and you can get it at HMV and uh, and uh, Walmart. So nice. So grab grab a copy if anyone still buys CDs. You can use them like Theo did in his Discman. Yes. <laughs> you can play it on your iPhone, whatever works for you, but it, it's worth a listen. It's it's definitely a cool album. Well, and it's, you know, it's very consistent with the message that we sort of carry with us, uh, you know, on a daily basis, and that's hope and healing, and, uh, you know, um, it's a it's a dark album, and... Uh, it is for sure, yeah. Because, you know, obviously I need to get some things off my chest musically, and, uh, you know, it is a country album, so... You know, um, most country albums, true country albums, uh, you know, talk about, you know, life struggles and, and how, you, how to figure out how to get out of them. Yeah, for sure. It, and it definitely has that, you know, I mean, a good country song to me has always told a story. And all of the songs in this album do a really good job of telling that story in the classic sort of country music style. Yeah. And, you know, I'll say this, I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but what I can do uh, as good as anybody's, I can tell a good story. And, uh, you know, Johnny Cash wasn't the greatest singer in the world, but what he did better than anybody else was he told a hell of a story. And so, you know, that's sort of 
you know, why the album is sort of the way that it is, 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 a uh, you know, um, and the one thing I discovered after writing playing with fire was that, you know, you take all of the hockey out of my book and I'm telling one third of the population of the world stories of people who are experienced, you know, childhood trauma and how we end up sort of, uh, coping with, you know, the emotional pain and scars that are left behind from these, uh, experiences in our childhood. And, and, uh, you know, eventually some way, somehow we hit the old proverbial rock bottom and, and then we start to climb back out of the sort of the abyss of, of, you know, that emotional pain. And, and really that's what the album sort of, you know, the story of the album is. Yeah, we had a lot of people when we asked them to share their memories of you in anticipation of this interview, a lot of guys who said what an inspiration you've been, you know, a guy who hit rock bottom, who had that trauma, and who's come back and really, you know, acted as a, a crusader against a lot of this and showing people it can be done. So, Theo, even outside of hockey, you've you've changed lives um, of fans everywhere. Well, and, uh, you know, that's been my experience. You know, I remember, you know, the first book signing we did in Toronto, and, uh, you know, I didn't really have a whole lot of expectations for the book other than, you know, for my own selfish reasons, which was, you know, to put this stuff down on paper, you know, take one last look at it and put it in its rightful place, which was, you know, the past. And so I show up at this book signing, 400 people show up at this book signing. And I was like, you know, this is weird, you know? And, and so I started signing books and, you know, out of the corner of my eye, I spot this guy in line and he's got my book clutched against his chest and his face is buried in the floor and he's walking really slow. And, you know, I followed him all the way to the front of the line. He gets to the front of the line. He sets the book on the table and, you know, looks me in the eye and says, me too. And, and, uh, you know, that's when I sort of knew the reason why I wrote this book. And, and since that first me too, you know, we've had over, you know, 500,000 other people, uh, either directly or indirectly say me too as well. So, um, you know, it's the reason why I do what I do and, and, uh, it's to help other people find their own voice. And, and when you find your own voice, you know, there's so much empowerment that happens, uh, you know, when we get an opportunity to tell our story in a safe place, in a safe environment. And, uh, you know, that's really what it's all about. And I think that's the reason why we're all here is to help people uh, who've had difficult things happen in their life. It's, it's you know, sort of our, our job that we are there for somebody to help them get through, you know, the most difficult times in their life. Because, you know, there's been so many people that have helped me along the way. It's sort of me, a way of me, you know, paying back them for, for, uh, you know, being there for me when I needed people the most. And, yeah. And I mean, we've all had people that have been there for us and I totally agree with you. I mean, as a, as a species, as a race, we have to help out other people. That's just how, how this world's going to keep being a good place. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, you know, trauma is the string which binds us all together and, and, uh, you know, nobody's immune to, to trauma and and that's been my experience because I've ran into so many people uh you know literally millions uh who've expressed to me that they've also had that same experience and Theo if someone is experiencing trauma whether it's you know the similar trauma you experienced in their childhood whatever it is what advice can you give those people to you know help them cope help them get through that well you know they're certainly not alone in their experience but um their experience is, like I said, the most common experience in in uh, in our life, uh, and that you know you just need to find a safe place or a safe person to be able to, you know, tell your truth. And like I said, once you're able to to express that and and say it, um, there's an incredible amount of empowerment that comes behind it. For sure. Very powerful words, Theo. Thank you. Anything else you want to share with, uh, with the Flames fans listening tonight? Anything, uh, any uh, upcoming appearances, anything else? We got the tour, we got the album, anything else you're up to that you want to share? 
I've always been grateful for, you know, the support of, you know, the Calgary Flames fans, uh, um, uh, every step of the way. And, uh, you know, when I moved back here a few years ago, you know, uh, the city opened its arms for me once again, and, uh, have been absolutely incredible supporters for all the things that I'm doing. And, and, uh, so it's much appreciated and, uh, you know, glad that, uh, uh, they've been there for me when uh, you know when I needed them the most. For sure, and and it's you know I mean I was a kid growing up in the '90s. You were the face of the Flames for me growing up, so I know how much you meant to me, even inspiring me as a hockey player. And we've heard that from so many people of all ages that you know whether it's your hockey, what you've done after, how big of an inspiration you've been. So I think this city's as fortunate to have you as it sounds like you are to have this city. Well, you know the the feeling is definitely mutual, and and. Uh, you know, there's a lot. There's still lots of great stuff that we're going to experience uh, together down the road, and I look forward to that. Thanks so much, Theo. We appreciate your time tonight. Hey okay, guys, have a good one. No problem. That was our chat with Theron Flurry here on Fireside Chat.